Hello everyone, welcome back to the Web3 conference. I hope you had a wonderful day so far and we have got so many more amazing talks that you will be really interested to see, which includes very much this one. We're gonna be talking about DAOs in this talk. So I hope you are geared with lots of questions and lots of conversation to be had with the wonderful host here and, and speaker, Dr. Deborah Duong uh, that we've got with us today. So a little bit of housekeeping from me, um, just to say hello to everyone in the chat box. We've already had a couple of you say howdy here. If you're in the room, please do say hello. Oh, more of you are popping up, which is lovely. Loving to see the emojis as well. Definitely give uh, Deborah some lovely emojis as she's going through her talk. She'll very much appreciate it. Oh, she's sending some hearts back. Lovely. Um, and then to the right hand side of the chat box is the Q&A section here. If you have a question for Deborah, then please do pop your questions in the Q&A tab. It makes it easier for her to see. If there is a question that is written in that tab that you think is particularly pertinent and something that you definitely want asked, please press that upvote button. She'll be going through them uh, either throughout the talk or at the end of the talk from the top to the bottom based on the priorities that you as the audience give her. So it's gonna be a fascinating conversation about DAOs. Questions are already flying in, that's fantastic. And we look forward to everything that Dr. Deborah has got to say. So over to you. Thanks so much. Well, today I'm gonna to talk to you about blockchains for decentralized autonomous organizations that make products and profits. A DAO constitution is the physics of a metaverse. The distributed autonomous organization is more than just a way of counting votes. The rules in its smart contracts are the physics of a social organization, the infrastructure of social relations that self-organize on its basis. Ideally, very little governance is by voting, better if done in everyday buying and selling in the market and with the smart contract constitution itself. We want to design a constitution maybe like the U.S. Constitution where James Madison said ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Much, ambi much attention has been paid to preventing a double spend in blockchain, but comparatively little to the effects on societies. However, with the proper incentives in place, this can receive as much attention and would prevent social ills such as double spends are prevented successfully. We can use social simulation to find the unintended consequences and second order effects effects of smart contracts on society. The implications of socioeconomic infrastructure. Our socioeconomic infrastructure is just one possible out of many imaginable. It is hacked by elites with consequences unintended by those who designed the constitution of, of nations, no matter how genius. The technology of our present socioeconomic system has soft constraints. That is, things are easier to do or harder to do. And this has big implications for social ills. So today we ask, what if those constraints are lifted? What if consumers can clearly see the history of the products they buy so they could not be deceived? What if we could objectively assign credit to people for work they are capable of doing? What if we could unlock the ideas of all the people in a company, not just the few at the top? What if we could use the power of the market against the instinct of power and dominance and the deceptions that support that naked power? So I have for you some examples of social simulation that can study the social implications of smart contracts. I ask, how can intelligent agent simulation be used to study un unintended consequences of smart contracts in a socioeconomic system? Well, to do this, we have to look at complex adaptive systems and self-organization. We can look at the macro level institutions that emerge from micro level human cognitive traits. And by institutions, I mean Weberian institutions. That is what people expect from one another in a society. 
the capacity to seek utility in both perception and action is one micro level human cognitive trait. Another is the tendency to induce categories and create symbols and roles with them. And another human micro level trait is cognitive dissonance. While all these can interact with the smart contract to emerge different institutions or commonly expected behaviors. Um, in my research program, um, I've worked on institutions and emergent social institutions in simulations for over 30 years. I had the first intelligent agent social simulation in 1991. And in the simulation, social class, status symbols, and racism and sexism emerged. Uh, then in 1996 and published in 2004 again, uh, Sister was made of the symbolic interactionist simulation of trade and emergent roles. And from this simulation, a role-based division of labor, price, and a standard of trade emerged. And then finally, in military simulations, my nexus simulation in 2007 had emergent corruption and popular support based on divisive information operations, which are uh, popular topics today. I'm the CTO of Rejuve, um, and Rejuve is a spin-off of the Singularity Net ecosystem. Rejuve is a longevity research network organization that crowdsources research from the community of science to find solutions to the problem of aging. We find solutions to radical longevity. We want to solve the actual problem of aging, not just in increments. Our AI is important in combining researchers' models as services in the singularity net to hypothesize longevity treatments specific to individuals. The goal of the combinations is to create a holistic self-organizing simulation of the human body with continually improving connections between the levels of resolution of the simulation, the micro level and the macro level I was talking about. The public or users of our app contribute data to these models. All contributors of data and models are rewarded in a proportionate manner in, the, in an end-to-end -end complete token economy. Our methods of decentralization, decentralization can be used in any Web3.0 data company. And so I would like to present them to you now. In the decentralization, in decentralization in Rejuve, we have a new look at products and profits in a decentralized company. Our tokenomics decentralize the organization of the network in several ways. The production of products is decentralized and self-organized from the bottom up. Data and IP contributors own the products in proportion to their marginal contribution. And a hybrid AI and blockchain system determines the self-organization and assignment of credit in the system. So we have principles for the design of decentralized production and profit making. First, that the principle of the ownership of the product of one's labor. This is kept track of with our self-sovereign NFTs. Second, the principle of self-definition and equal opportunity. The objective automated assembly of data and models occurs in a self-organizing market in which people can define their contribution instead of having it defined for them in hierarchical systems. And finally, consumer demand. Market-based incentives for social good based on the transparency of the distributed ledger generate consumer demand. Well, the first principle, let's take a little bit of a deep dive is the ownership of the products of one's labor. These are kept track of with the self-sovereign NFTs. We have two self-sovereign NFTs. First of all, 
the data, self-sovereign NFT. This NFT is owned solely by the data contributor. And this is whether the data is personal health data of the app users or model IP of the researchers in the network. It keeps track of, track of permissions given for data to be used in particular products. It serves as a decentral ID that is connected to personal data and IP and proves ownership. And this works in conjunction with the product self-sovereign NFT. This NFT is sharded into utility tokens that are distributed in a proportion to product ownership. They are initially given to data and IB contributors in proportion to their contribution, beginning with the hypotheses of a product from our AI and continuing through clinical trials, FDA approvals, and sales in pharmacies. If a product is created, then the data and IP contributors are compensated in Rejuve utility tokens, which is a separate token from the NFTs with every sale of that product. But it's a long time to wait for a blockbuster uh, drug to appear. And um, there's a lot of risk involved in this. And to compensate for this, up to half of the data IP contributors utility tokens may be sold to entrepreneurs who may be more risk tolerant or believe in the product more than the data and IP contributor does. Sales to the entrepreneurs sends tokens back to the pay, to pay contributors sooner, incentivizing contributions. So here's a little picture of our token system. Uh, now the Rejuve utility token is not an NFT, it's a utility token and it flows through the economy. So we can see the data contributors through the app, use Rejuve tokens to buy treatments and wearables. Then entrepreneurs send Rejuve tokens back to app users early and pharmacies send them later for blockbuster drugs. Labs and Rejuve, the Rejuve Corporation early on pays app users before um, their data and before the entrepreneurs can take over when the network is large enough. So we start by kind of babysitting the network a while, but um, the incentives are there so that it, it can grow. So who gets credit and who gets chosen is objective here. This setup is a compromise between self-ownership and purchasing others' labor. Purchasing others' labor sends money back to IP contributors without employment so that the data and IP contributors are more free to define their own roles. This limits the excesses of buying and selling others' labor. Um, we're, we are attempting to solve the winner-take-all nature of our present socioeconomic data economy, where data and software IP don't really have a good reimbursement model. At least in a physical economy, physical things are used up and those make physical things, and those physical things um, make work for those who, in order to replace those physical things once they're used up. But when someone sells their DNA, it's one and done, and we're trying to fix that. The smart contract based DAO replaces the big pharma middleman that buy and sell data without taking the profits that the big pharma middleman takes. The AI determines the assignment of critic based on objective criteria. And the AI can also find the, demo, the persons of the right demographic characteristics for phase one clinical trials, replacing again, big farmer and those who would take profits. Next principle, self-definition and equal opportunity. <clears throat> the, 
This is gained by the objective automated assembly of data and models in a self-organizing market. In Rejuve, scientist models of different aspects of the human body are crowdsourced, combined, into, combined with an AI into consonant sets that predict better together. Automated matchmaking based on objective criteria eliminates human's bias that may be on the basis of nepotism, cronyism, tribalism, or other demographic characteristics. The AI is causal and also blind, as in blind auditions, double blind clinical trials, and blind peer reviews. The only criteria for success is how well tasks are done. Generality is incentivized and is sufficient to make a model that predicts better in all states of the human body in a variety of contexts and conditions. The pieces of product are made by researchers and data scientists who are paid by interpreters in advance. As no one assigns them a role, they get to define themselves and compete on a level playing field. What this system is without a conception of stepping on one toes because it is no longer personal. The system will not get bogged down with office politics and hierarchical groupthink. If scientists know they will receive credit for their contribution, they won't care if their work is modified by other scientists because they will get credit. Assignment of credit self-organizes in the free market through the emergence of price, such that a rarer model can charge more for its services because it makes an entire set of models it cooperates with perform a task better. So how does self-organization in the model assembly work? We use sister-based we use sister-based self-organization of co-evolving models as in the basis, as its basis of self-organization as a layer on top of singularity net. Sister agents perceive and act based on utility. In this case, optimizing reduced tokens in a market where research problems are paid to be solved. Tasks are research problems in longevity. And winning consonant sets show the best predictions of the states of the human body. Models employ other models that increase predictive capability. The market incentivizes generality as well as specialization because there isn't a single task that a model must solve to gain a profit. But multiple tasks shape a model with multiple profits. Some of these tasks may use general models and some specific. So data and IP contributors are paid in a manner like software as a service, a little a little bit per run or per product sale. Finally, the principle of consumer demand. Market-based incentives for social good based on the transparency of the distributed ledger. This is how we employ consumer demand. We don't claim to have the ultimate in answer but only one possible of many that can be approved upon. Our AI assembler can be replaced with other ones and other layers and services on top of singularity net. So we also have a way to choose amongst these infrastructures. We respect the creative power of the market by facilitating greater transparency and choice for the consumer. Consumers can state their value preferences about products and services. For example, that it be created in a green manner, an equitable manner, or that it not be advertised in a divisive venue. Our AI looks at the distributed ledger to measure how well the product complies with the consumer value preferences and ranks products and makes them visible based on this ranking to consumers. In the case of equity, the AI that results in the most equity wins. To, inv 
to incentivize the choice of values, Pareto optimization is used to minimize any cost to the consumer. Value for price will remain just as important as it is in the market without the Pareto optimization. So here is how equity self-organizes. In this style, spending in the market is voting. Not depend, it is not dependent on voting, but governance is in the smart contract that gives the power of choice ultimately to the consumer. This facilitates a proof of social value, such as equity, rather than a proof uh, based on money or human bias for this blockchain. This creates a new gravity towards social values within corporations rather than owner profit alone. As we can see from this figure, Pareto improvement allows for a new gravity within the system that's for free because as, as there is more room for Pareto improvement or uh, um, having different values, you know, uh, all be fulfilled. Um, there's a lot of room given that um, only one value is fulfilled now, and that's um, value for price. If we have more values, well, there's lots of room where value for price can stay the same, but these other values can increase. And there, there'll be a lot of pressure for on the market for those values to increase. So that will be the new gravity of the system. Uh, and for everything, we do need a measure and we have a modified guinea coefficient that measure that measures equity, but also um, assigns, allows um, people to um, own more if they have contributed more. So in summary, technology can both change the space of possibilities and predict the effects of the new space of possibilities on the socioeconomic system. Blockchain and AI systems can incentivize creative bottoms-up contributions so that people can own the products of their labor and define themselves. Consumer-side demand can apply new incentives for social good and even to choose the best AI and reputation systems that advance those social good. AI can assist everywhere there is an ability to measure and consumer-side demand can incentivize increasingly better measurement itself. Okay, so my talk is over and I'd like to answer some questions. Let's see, we've got about seven minutes. Okay, so why is the smart contract a constitution or what do I mean by that? Well, um, you can think of the constitution as kind of the more uh, solid rules that exist in a socioeconomic system. And then things that people vote for are the more fluid rules. Um, the smart contract in a blockchain um, is fairly permanent and so must be fairly general. Whereas the things that are voted on are more specific. But the ideal is that um, there aren't a lot of things to vote on, that the market itself takes care of that voting. Okay. Uh, how do I handle ethical issues with handling health data in my crowdsourcing strategy? Well, uh, there we have um, complete HIPAA compliant um, um, databases and uh, the, the fact that uh, we can keep track of data and permissions doesn't mean it's revealed. It's completely encrypted. And so, so that's taken account in our design of NFTs. Okay. Will this allow us to have less cost for these autonomous social organizations? 
and that will be able to help more easily the beneficiaries. Yes, indeed. Um, who is it that said the problem with socialism is all the evenings wasted on trying to come to a consensus? If you can vote with your feet, if you can vote with uh, your preferences towards products, then that consensus can happen through the blockchain and the AI naturally without you having to have too many arguments over what to vote for. But the, but the constitution must be well designed for this to happen. And we have a methodology to ensure that it is well designed and that is computer simulation. We can look through all of the possibilities with as much rigor as people who look through all the possibilities of double spend in blockchain. We can apply that to the effects on social organizations. Okay. Um, how will we do solve the cold start problem in AI models? Where the models need a lot of data to make good predictions, but you need people to use the app to generate the data in the first place. Well, um, what we do, what we have now in the app is a way to crowdsource science from the literature. Um, what we have is um, our Bayesian expert system that allows people to enter results from meta um, analyses and systematic reviews. And these are um, the these are familiar to scientists and researchers and allows that, for example, you can enter the relative risk of one condition on another, and you can also enter um, the sensitivity and specificity of tests that are found uh, by re um, randomized controlled trials. And this is our initial attempt at crowdsourcing science, that we make an expert system to do it at first, but since it's a Bayesian net, it can learn from data as well. And so it will improve as time goes on, but we start out at an initial point and that initial point is the best one can figure out from the literature as it exists. So this is actually um, a good way to put together lots of different information from the literature. Now, um, granted, not every combination of every, uh, drug or um, or a condition is available in the literature, but that's why we have consonant sets and dissonant sets. Like sometimes people's theories contradict each other and sometimes um, they go well with data. And so uh, we have ways to test the predictions that data make together. And the successful sets that predict more will arise and become better gradually in our system. Okay, let's see. Doesn't the double blind nature of AI models make them black boxes that may be unwelcome? Okay, um, well, um, Yes, I can see what you're saying. Um, but think of it as a blind audition. Um, it used to be that um, human bias c f figured in greatly in um, the composition of orchestras until they developed the practice of the blind audition where you couldn't see a person and you judged how well they were doing because you're judging it based on the results alone. Now, who can argue with this? Uh, the people who say, I'm not prejudiced. Well, if you weren't prejudiced, then, <laughs> then you wouldn't mind not seeing the irrelevant characteristics. So in a way, what, what most AIs do is use correlation over overly much, you know, a correlation and that correlation gets in the way of finding the causes of phenomena, medical phenomena. Uh, there are standard practices in epidemiology, epidemiology to tease out 
causation. Um, and that's based on um, uh, holding all else the same in those demographic characteristics, which is a whole lot like, you know, being blind to the traits of, of different demographic groups. Um, and so is it unwelcome? Uh, I would say it's welcome to all sides. Um, and, um, you know, in our world, in the real world, some things are easier and some things are harder. And one thing that's easier, easy for us to do is be prejudiced, you know, <laughs> and, and look at someone's demographic traits. Um, and we're just making this infrastructure a little different. So it's harder to do that, but not, uh, not impossible given, um, that we need other things to be done, you know, that that can be uh, resolved through governance if possible. Okay, I'm over time. <laughs> Thank you very much.